Can you hear me there? I don't have feedback. Uh, I'm, I don't think I don't yes, I'm hear you perfectly okay. Uh, anyway, it, I, I'm talking about uh, learning together, uh, which is one of my blogs. Uh, it was very interesting the last couple of um, sessions. Uh, Janet Salmon uh, mentioned that educators, academics have many purposes for starting blogs. And I too have several blogs, and each of them has a slightly different purpose, kind of like uh, Janet Bianchini, who just talked to us. Um, uh, my intellectual blog, I suppose, when I really want to think and write, that's uh, advanceducation.blogspot.com. And then I have one called uh, Teacher's Toolkit for Shared Learning, which is also at Blogspot. Uh, that one's where I sort of write up tips and tutorials and things like that. And then I've got something called Just Curious, uh, which was a refugee from a WordPress press blog. Uh, not WordPress, sorry, Posturus. I, had, I ported it to WordPress. And then I've got something called Multiliteracy. So actually, I've got several blogs. I've got Tumblr blogs. I like to play with blogs. But the one that I do weekly is Learning Together. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, let's see if I can advance the slides here. So uh, that's me and the uh, fourth over from the left. And we're, we're at the uh, um, Spring Blog Festival 2015. And so what I'm going to talk about is how this Learning Together project, uh, it's been going on really for 15 years now, although we started this particular rendition of it in uh, 2010. But anyway, we've, I've been doing this for about 15 years, uh, communicating with people, and I've been quite influence. I, th I think I was a connectivist learner before uh, George Siemens came up with the article on connectivism in 2004. But um, there's been really a proliferation of opportunities to get online and meet other educators as Nellie's many projects are really great examples. I'm actually kind of, um, it's ironic that I'm speaking about this little weekly event that I do uh, on learning together in the same, uh, in the context of uh, Nellie's many projects, this being one. But they are a little bit different, and that's one thing that we'll, each of us does with our blogs, is we uh, add a little value added, uh, something unique to, the, uh, to what we do. Uh, Sir Ken Robinson says that uh, there are 8 billion uh, individual, uh, multiple intelligences in the, in the world, what he means is that each person has one. So I think that's what we do. We Each blog is about our unique multiple intelligence. Uh, anyway, we'll end up with uh, how some thoughts on how learning online uh, reshapes our notions of engaging with students. Oh, goodness. Be quiet, iPad. Okay, anyway, this is kind of a 15-year perspective of what's sort of been going on for the last 15 years in, in my little world uh, in 1990s. Oh, by the way, just something uh, that was said earlier, I uh, just read the book called The Innovators, Sir Isaacson. He wrote a, a biography of Steve Jobs. And um, he, um, I just remember reading that uh, Justin Hall was one of the first bloggers in, uh, in uh, 1994, I think he started the blog. Uh, he was working with uh, Howard Rheingold and, uh, uh, on Wired. Uh, he, he was also one of the first people on Wired magazine. But anyway, 1994, he started a blog. He, he kind of started the concept. So blogging was going on back in the last century. Uh, anyway, in 1997, that's 94. I didn't have that on my list here. Uh, 97, uh, Dave Wynette started study.com, which unfortunately has no link. By the way, uh, I should point out that at the bottom of this this first page, this page right here, there is a tiny URL which is where you can get these slides. These slides are on a shared Google Drive, and it's tinyurl.com is something I like to use rather than Google because uh, you can give your blog a memo, uh, but as you can give your tiny, your shortened URL a mnemonic, and this one is bats 2015 SBF. 
So if you can remember that, and you can remember tinyurl.com slash advanced 2015 SPF, then you can retrieve these slides right now if you want. So anyway, back to um, the, uh, the chronology. Uh, Dave Wynette started uh, study.com. And uh, th these slides that you pick up off the internet, if you go to advanced 2015 SPF at tinyurl.com, then you'll actually be able to link, uh, hit the links here. So study.com just, they just sold the, the, uh, the, the domain for it. And um, so, but that was something that had gone on for itself for 15 years. And I was really sad to see that go. But we'll have Dave Wynette on Learning Together one time and talk about that. Uh, in 1998, well actually, in yeah, about that time, uh, 1998, Seven somewhere in there, uh, they've got me teaching study.com, and I took a course called Writing and Grammar. Uh, it was it started off being an email course. We were all experimenting at the time, uh, but writing for webheads came from that. And if you click on the link, you can find there's a website for it there. Then in uh, 2000, uh, writing for webheads kind of took off because we sort of experimented with uh, we had a lot of a few teachers teaching several language learners, and they were basically writing uh, posts, which we'd post on our Web1 website. It wasn't really a blog. It kind of, in a way, looked like a blog, but it was all top down as far as, well, I mean, they were sending me the stuff, but I was putting all the material online. And in 2000, I was invited to be a speaker at the 2000 Peace Hall Conference in Vancouver, and I uh, had a, uh, a screen and some people joined us in live in that chat, and that was kind of unique at the time. Uh, this started catching on with educators in 2002. Uh, we started an EVO session called Webheads in Action. A lot of people think Webheads started back then. And to keep things in perspective again, that's when George Siemens, 2004, wrote his paper on connectivism which uh, kind of defines I think, how we learn online, connecting to one another, and uh, basically the knowledge being in the network. Uh, you, you are as intelligent as the most intelligent node in the network, basically. So knowledge is distributed in that way throughout a network. And by connecting to one another, we keep ourselves basically smart. So a year later, uh, we started something called Webheads and Action Online Convergence. That was a, um, a online conference that we put on for free up till then. There, there were several online conferences, but you, you always had to put down a credit card. And um, but we, we decided the Webheads just to do it ourselves. And that was one year before the K-12 online conference, which was also possibly one of the first really mainstream uh, and, and repeated online conferences. It's still going on, K-12 online conference. And um, I'm really seeing no chat here, by the way. Let's see if I can make this expand. I'm not sure how to do this anyway. Let me see if I can. Oh, I don't see a chat. Um, hmm, must be a way to undock it somehow. Nope. OK. I can't see the chat. So maybe someone could come in and uh, tell me if anybody has questions in the chat. Um, oh, anyhow, yeah. uh, 2000. Yes, yes. Sorry, yeah. Sorry. 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 Sure. Learning Conference, also for free, which was probably one of the first ones put on by real academics. Uh, I think it was. Uh, uh, it, because he started, what, what that came out to be in 2008 was a MOOC. The first connected to this MOOC, the first MOOC ever was. Uh, developed by St uh, Siemens Downs Cormier. And then a year later, we put on our last web that's an action online convergence. We, we put on three of them. Uh, I know what Nellie does for 24 hours uh, is pretty tough to keep going at a stretch like that. Uh, we were doing these three day conferences. And well, in 2009, I decided not to do it again. That's where learning together came from. I decided to, I liked the concept, but I wanted to do it week by week. So uh, basically, let's see. Uh, so you can see that learning together developed. First of all, we were meeting synchronously online from 1998. Uh, 
went into WebEd's in action. They, we always run this online every Sunday. Um, and WebEd's in action online convergences uh, made me decide that the best way to channel that weekly online meeting was to do it through a kind of a formal, a more formal uh, presentation of some kind. It's not really formal, it's a conversation. Anyway, uh, so it started in September 2010. If you, since it's weekly, that's at least 50 um, sessions a week. So um, so that's uh, four years, 200 events, plus the ones we had in 2010 from September, and we've had about 25 of them this year. So anyway, we're coming up to uh, 250 events. So that's a nice run. Uh, usually we meet on Sundays, but sometimes, just for Nelly, we meet on a Saturday, like we're doing right now. This is a learning together event. Uh, we're basically trying to get encourage people to have conversations. So I think that's a, the, the value we add is it's a little bit different from uh, the presentation format. We don't we we welcome conversations. Uh, our events are in Hangout or they're in uh, Illuminate, and uh, that is a blackboard collaborate. And we try to run them as conversations. So I'll explain how it works, uh, how we, we run them. And if you need any links, those links, by the way, if you get the presentation at uh, that's 2015SBF, you'll find these links, all these links, where you can click on and find more information, deeper information about what I'm talking about. But for right now, also, you can also go to webheads in action, oh, sorry, webheads.info, um, and there, there is at the top of the page, which uh, you can also find more information. So this was actually kind of a webheads endeavor. So we're going to change topics a little bit. Are there any questions? Not sure why. I can't see if I, what I can do here. I'm trying to make the to do something about my, I think that's what, next? No, this is actually learning together. If you click on the, um, on the, the one that says uh, a full program of events, you'll come to the top of the, that page. And that is, uh, gives you a little uh, table of contents that wikis are very good at. And in the table of contents, uh, Two things you should notice. One, there's an archives at the lower right-hand corner, and the other one is uh, the next upcoming event. So if you click on next coming up e event, go to the next screen. You can also reach it through a tiny URL. Tinyurl.com slash learning together takes you to the next upcoming event, which today, when I made the slide, was the one we're at right now. So um, I list uh, not just events that we organize together, but I also list uh, just about anything I, that comes across my radar, as long as it's open. As, uh, by that I mean if you have to pay money or have a, even have a password to log in, or if you, ha if you have to be a member of an organization to see the archive, if the archive is not open, then it's not really open. So um, but anything that's open, I try to list here, because I'm sort of keeping track of, um, you know, the things that, that are available to teachers in general. So um, looking over at the archive index, which is in the sidebar, a link from the sidebar, the archive index, um, if you scroll down this page, you would catch it from the learningtogether.pbworks.com sidebar, then you'll find that those 250 sessions are listed. And they each link to, uh, to where I actually archive things. So that's where the blog comes in. I archive things at learningtogether.net. And each entry has um, a page that looks something like this. This is from last week. Uh, there is a link on the side there to, to the About page. The About page uh, gives information about uh, learning Together gives, actually, if you go to learningtogether.net slash about, 
then you will find all the, in, all the links to all the other sites. So things kind of link back to each other there. But pretty typically, uh, the last one we had was a Hangout. So you, you get the YouTube video. And then from the video, we make a, an MP3. We have show notes there. Any slides that we put up, we, uh, we put there as well. So uh, the um, oh, oh if, if, in the about page also there is a uh, um, there is a slide presentation that I did before, and uh, because I've talked about learning together before, obviously, so those slides were put up at slideshare.net. So here again, there's a link here on this page. It works in the uh, Google Drive version. And you can see, for example, uh, slides about our network um, and an interesting insight on why learning together works and also why Nelly's uh, events work it has a lot to do with cognitive surplus, which is an idea of Clay Shirky's. The idea is that, is that as long as you don't pollute the ecosystem with uh, money, then people will uh, respond to it for free because it, Clay Shirky writes actually a, a whole book with examples of how people uh, are happy to contribute to passions and causes because they have cognitive surplus. That is, they, then they have the ability to get on the internet and actually leverage what they're doing. So because of that, they have the time and they have the ability. Uh, they actually like to uh, to do things because they get recognition, because it makes them feel good. Um, they, they feel that they're helping the world. So as long as those uh, parameters maintain, then people will rise up to, uh, to do good work online. But uh, according to some experiments by Bessie, called Summer Blocks, those little pictures you see on the screen, um, he did some interesting experiments showing that if he paid people to do them, that they, they uh, they didn't want to do the task so much as when he didn't pay them, they would do it in their spare time. Anyway, uh, we're about to change the topic. Are there any questions at this point? I'm going to talk now about how learning together works. Um, those uh, posts uh, at learningtogether.net, like this one, once I posted it, I scoop it, and you probably know scoop it. So at um, learning together, when I scoop it, it comes out on my scoop, my scoop it page. So there's a scoop it page for learning together, and uh, you scoop uh, a website. When you scoop a link, you can also choose to post it to Facebook. You can post it to Twitter. You can post it to um, LinkedIn. There are a number of places. Uh, I, I choose Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, there's a on Twitter. You can search on Learning Together, and I think on what you see right here, uh, or the, the last one, is an example of one of my scooped posts. And then I think Durf must have uh, come upon the scoop it herself and posted because. It, well, anyway, she, it's hard to say why people, uh, what leads them to repost your tweets. But uh, in any event, it's one way of getting the word out. And then LinkedIn, similarly, uh, if you go to my profile on LinkedIn, and you can find my updates. Not that you'd want to do that, but that's essentially where they end up. Uh, Nick Peachy is really successful, I think, at um, posting on LinkedIn. He, uh, yeah, he, he, he works from LinkedIn. Uh, his LinkedIn posts uh, are posted out to different places. Or, no, no, I take that back. I think he works in Scoop It. Yeah, he uh, works in Scoop It, posts to a Web Ads in Action uh, group on LinkedIn. And so you're constantly seeing his posts and his tweets. And it's very effective because uh, they're all uh, to the point about uh, practical things that you'd want to know. So it's kind of a, a way of microblogging. Okay, so um, let's see. So 
once you when you post, uh, I always tag our posts. Uh, learning together is the tag I use for this one. And Tagboard is a good site that aggregates. You can there that link actually does work. And uh, if you click on it, you'll go to this uh, aggregation. But Tagboard aggregates posts from Google Plus and from Twitter, pretty much. Uh, there might be some other sites it gets, but it'll show you what people are posting. It's a very nice site for exploring uh, tags. So, okay. Uh, any questions? Go on to the next topic. Everybody happy in the chat room? I can minimize the. I've kind of got a, a routine going for um, for announcing our posts. This is what I do. I'm going to show you now. When I when I'm going to put on a learning together event, I make a post about it at learning together itself. I also send uh, notices out to some lists that I'm on. For example, the webheads list, uh, maybe an ed tech meme, things like that. So, uh, but the, and, and that's pretty much a matter of copy paste usually. And then I also put not, a notice on Facebook. Here are the sites that I post to. So, um, and also for all these sites, all these places where I post notices of upcoming events, I'll also go back afterwards and I tell them what we did. So I post also the link to the archive. Um, I'm not sure how um, helpful that is. I, I know Maria Kulusa is, uh, does do a lot of interaction with us on this. So. And she says uh, she retreats events that she enjoys, and she does. We notice that. Okay, so also Google Communities really is a really great tool for uh, you know organizing your events, your uh, your group, your community, your PLN that you gather, your blog or wherever. And um, these are some of the communities. I did a screenshot. There were there are a couple more off to the right, but these are this shot just happens to have most of the ones I post to. So there's a learning together community, a webheads in action community, something called EdTech Mo Mojo, which has all of eight members right now. So people at work are trying to get that together. And uh, TIL, which is Teachers for Interactive Language Learning, something that Benjamin Stewart has kind of got together. It's over, well over a thousand members. And then Web2 Teaching and Learning is just a place that I glommed on to. So anyway, really, the really neat thing, though, about Google Communities is their Hangouts, I think. Uh, those are really good ways to put on synchronous events. And you can hold conversations there. So the Learning Together link is at the bottom of this slide. Uh, something about the Hangouts coming in. OK, this is um, an example of one. Um, I believe if you click on that, that, that oh, if you click on that uh, link to the left there, you'll go to that page, events page. So a uh, Google, when you set up a, a Hangout on air, it creates uh, an event page for you, and that, all, that lets you converse on that page. Sort of like what Nelly is doing with, with IQ. There are conversation spaces. One nice affordance of uh, Google Hangouts is it's all on the same page. So um, you have everything here except the Hangout link. But we fix that as well. So what we're trying to do is set Hangouts. Sometimes when I learn about a Hangout, I'll go to the Hangout page and I don't really see a way to get into the Hangout. What you can do, the Hangout goes through uh, YouTube. It's recorded in YouTube as it plays. And it's also streamed while it's recording. So if you're at the event, you can click on that play button and you can hear the Hangout that's in progress. Uh, 
uh, after the fact, you can go and hear the recording. So it plays one or the other. But if you really want to join the Hangout, um, we have to do something else. So what we do is we, we you can, we, we basically, when you set up a Hangout, you get a, its link, uh, or when you start the Hangout, or actually even before you start the Hangout, you can get the Hangout link. And uh, you can start the Hangout, but not broadcast, and then you, and then you close the Hangout until you're ready. You can schedule a Hangout. You can, you can create a Hangout event weeks, months before you're going to actually do the Hangout. And then you can get its links, uh, and then you can take the YouTube embed and put it somewhere else. Uh, I generally put that embed on the learningtogether.pbworks.com page. And um, I also, uh, well, I put it in uh, webheadsinaction.org. Webheadsinaction.org is a site that Jeff LeBeau set up for us. It's uh, it is one of his World Bridges network sites. And he set it up in Drupal, and we have access to it, basically. So um, we've got a webheadsinaction.org slash live page there, which we just keep uh, putting notices up of our Hangouts. And then when we've done them, we can archive them there as well. But my preferred archive is uh, learningtogether.net. So, uh, in any event, there we publicize the link in all the spaces that we try to broadcast our sites. One is learningtogether.pbworks.com, that link to our next uh, event. We put the link to the Hangout there. We put the link to the Hangout uh, at the web and action org slash live site, and we also put the link to the Hangout in the uh, Google event, this conversation underneath there. So places that people are likely to go, they should find the, uh, the link to the Hangout. And we don't put that there until the presenter is in the Hangout, so that our Hangouts lately have started to get full. So um, you see in the uh, hangout itself in the in the at the bottom of the hangout when you're the owner of it you can see if people are listening to the hangout as opposed to just being in it so often there are people who are who arrived late perhaps the hangout is full or they just came and they didn't feel like uh, being coming to the hangout it's too early in the morning for them or they've got other people sleeping and they don't want to disturb them so we also embed at the bottom of this web is an action.org slash live page, a chat wing chat. Chat wing is just a nice little chat. We've got Shelly Terrell in one of her ebook sessions. We learned it, about it there. And it's been very robust for us. So it's chatwing.com slash vance stev, V A N C S T E V. And at that place, it actually, it's been so robust that it's. Uh, archived pretty much all our chats uh, since we started using it. They're all there. So uh, it's quite interesting. And also, you can copy the chat, the chat from your the, the part that's relevant to your last session and paste it. I can paste it on this website. It comes out and sticks there while the chat goes on. So it's quite interesting. Anyway, what, what we uh, are able to do here is we're able to put on a Hangout. And uh, give a way for anybody to come to it by posting its URL, its direct link, and then creating a way where if people are not able to get in or don't want to get in, they can interact with us, they can listen to the stream, and they can interact with us in the text chat. So often we have people communicating uh, in the text chat and in the uh, listening to the stream and then talking to us in the or people might ask questions in the text, text chat, and we can pass them back to the stream. I wrote a little article in TesselElectronicJournal.org, and the link is at the bottom of the slide, the reference. So that's an article that explains pretty much how I do all that. So 
I'm almost done, except for one very meaty last slide. Are there any questions anybody has so far? I don't. Is that Gene? Which do I prefer, Hangout or BB Collaborate? Okay, that's a good question. Yes, I agree with Maria. Um, I I do prefer Hangout. It really depends on what I want to do. If I uh, if I'm say presenting at a conference, I would prefer Collaborate because it's a lot easier to set up. Uh, that is, you just basically go there. Uh, it records automatically and. Uh, anybody can come, anybody can join. So uh, it's a lot less effort. But as far as what the way we run learning together, I much prefer uh, the Hangout because it's so much more conversational. We make it a point to, like right now, I'm sort of talking to myself um, and interacting with the text chat. But in the Hangout, I will talk maybe half the time or less, so the people in the people in the hangout have voices. Um, maybe Maria Lusa could speak to that. She's one of our. Uh, she's her, she's pictured here. The arrow is pointing to Robert Walkman. To the right of him is Nina Liakos, and to the right of her is Maria Kulus. Okay, so uh, this is actually, I'm, I'm giving a similar talk at the T-Cell conference coming up, and I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this, uh, scrolling down the chat. Um, such a little well, chat here. Not only do you have to expand it, but you have to also scroll it constantly. Okay, so Anyway, I'm really interested in how what we do impacts, impacts our practice. So I've listed a few things here, but uh, I'm going to uh, speak in my T-cell presentation a, a little bit more about these, especially down toward the bottom of the list. So what we do here is uh, a master learner, is that what Maria is referring to? Maria is saying she considers me a master learner. You know, I consider teachers to be master learners. And master learners is a coin, I think, termed by David Warlick uh, to describe what a teacher does. And I've often, you're, you're speaking to Stephen Downs uh, two hours from now. He's speaking to you. And one thing that he, uh, he, he calls it a principle, uh, and that is the, the fact that Teachers model and demonstrate, and learners practice and reflect. So there are four things that are going on in the teacher-learner ecosystem. There's modeling and demonstrating, practicing and reflecting. So I think if you're a master learner, you begin to understand that a master learner does all of those four things. A master learner would be one who understands the process well enough to become a teacher, be employed as a teacher. But in fact, he's modeling and demonstrating, but also reflecting and uh, and practicing. So we're doing that over and over again. It's kind of like a good cup of coffee. It just percolates. I got that idea from Stephen, and I've heard him say it many times in many of his talks that I've listened to. And unfortunately, I'm going to miss that because I've got to go to bed after this. I've got to get up about six hours from now. So I can't stay to the end of Stephen's talk. <laughs> Uh, but any any event, so but, so that that idea of being a master learner uh, is what this slide is about. It's uh, in the events that we put on like this, and this is one kind of that type of event where we come together and we share our knowledge. In learning together, we try to do that every week. It, it works really well because at least it works for me, um, and. We're interacting with peers. Shared problem solving is very much of it. Uh, Nina, who's in the previous slide, Nina Liakos, had a problem with something she put in a slideshow. It was not, she was trying to cover up students' names. She just wrote to the webheads list, and uh, they resolved her problem. Lots of people responded. And we do this, of course, 
talking to each other, we learn things from one another. Uh, we pursue connected professional development, and this changes our mindset toward teaching. Because when we connect with each other, then we start to, uh, you know, because it's, uh, it's ineffable what we do, that means that you don't really understand it until you do it. And once you've started doing it and then start understanding it, then your mindset changes toward the teaching that you're doing. And we get a lot of tips and tricks for using, for doing this with students. But we also learn how to truly flip not only our classes, but our professional development. And I might dwell on that point a moment, but before I do that, I wonder if anybody has any comments. Thank you, Nelly, and I'm glad I'll be seeing you in Toronto. Be there myself. Flying tomorrow night, 24 hours from now. OK, well, going back to the flip, this is something I got to, uh, to do in our last uh, EPO session. As you possibly know, I've been, I've, well, my first EPO session was in 2002, where I did Web as an Action. And that was basically started a community of practice that's been going on since then. Um, then for a while, I taught a course that I called Mental Literacies. And that was because I was asked to teach such a course by the TESOL principles and practice people. And uh, I taught that course under the TESOL auspices, but to keep it refreshed, I realize that if you're, if you're doing a course in something like multiple literacies, you have to be constantly doing it. You have to be practicing and reflecting while you're modeling and demonstrating. So in order to do that, I found it very useful to do EVO sessions on the topic. And as I was doing those EVO sessions, I started getting much more deeply into connectivism and, um, and Stephen Downs and his work. Uh, and Dave Cormier and his very interesting ideas on uh, on, on MOOCs. And um, basically, I started, I, I changed my session to call it multi MOOC. And I started running it in the format of a MOOC. And basically, it just happens to be a five week EVO session. And there are five steps to coping successfully in MOOCs, according to Dave Cormier. And the first one is to. Um, to orient yourself in the session. We spent a week on that. Everybody orients in EVO sessions. Uh, EVOs, by the way, might be MOOCs that started back in 2001. That's when they started doing it. But in any event, the first week is pretty much uh, orienting. And then by the second week, you start declaring. Declare means that you start posting your introduction. You start. Uh, explaining to people why you're there. And the third week, you might network. And network means you start finding other people in the, in the mix that, um, uh, that you're interacting with. And that forms a cluster. Actually, in a MOOC with thousands of people, uh, you probably will form clusters of people. You'll find that people cluster. In other words, so what you get out of a MOOC is you, you just interact with a small circle of people and forget the rest. Uh, there's impossible to follow everything in a MOOC. So what you're going to get out of a MOOC is what you, you yourself get through your cluster. Um, now, uh, the last step is to focus. And for some people, that means uh, uh, do some collaborative projects that might take place beyond the MOOC. But the, the flip idea that I got for the last EVO session was to resolve a problem I had with Minecraft. I was very interested in Minecraft as a teaching tool, but I didn't know how to get into it. So it turns out that uh, a, a researcher named Ito and about 10 or 12 other people wrote a, a free ebook, which is called um, Hanging Out, uh, Hanging Out the last one is geeking out, hanging, hanging out something. And does anybody remember what you do in hanging out? Um, anyway, this is the stages of 
getting involved in games. First of all, you hang out in the game, and then you start learning it more deeply. And once you hit a threshold, you start um, uh, geeking out in the game, which means you, you get more obsessed with it. So April 9th, Minecraft teaching with Vicki Davis. Oh, yes. Oh, that would be interesting to go to. OK, I'll put that in my calendar. April 9th. I wonder if I'm on holiday then. Anyway, that's definitely on my horizon. Ali is talking about the Second Life MOOC, which starts April 1st, I think, and goes for quite a long time. Um, in any event, what I was doing was hanging out in Minecraft for some time before I finally decided that I wanted to learn it uh, in an EBO session. But nobody was going to put one on, so I decided to put one on myself. Now, this is flipped because I didn't know myself about Minecraft, but I wanted to find people who could. I wanted to find a group that we could put ourselves into the uh, into the uh, the ambience. You know, and just immerse ourselves in Minecraft. And so we did this. It's unusual, I think, for moderators who don't know their subject to uh, start an EBO session. But that's what I did. I actually had collaborators. Uh, Mariana Smolchitz and her son Philip. We had interacted already in learning together. So learning together here again was um, bringing us together into EVO. So with these, with this team, me who wanted to, to do it, and uh, Mariana and especially Philip, the eleven-year-old Philip Smolchitz, um, we resolved to put this on. We attracted other people. We attracted Jeff Kuhn, for example, whose picture you saw on an earlier slide. And um, Jeff knew quite a lot about Minecraft. We just attracted him. We didn't, and, and he became one of our co-moderators. But if you see what I'm getting at, we're, because if you consider yourself a master learner, uh, you don't really feel that you have to be on top of the game to create a learning situation. You can flip it to the extent that you can go into it without knowing uh, so much about the topic. You don't know everything about the topic, but you find people uh, who are willing to interact with you, and together you all learn, because there are people there who know enough to basically teach it to the others or guide the others. So it worked out really well in our case. Uh, Jeff set up a server. Um, we went there and we put it in creative mode to begin with. And that meant we, we went there. We, we had really, uh, what we're doing right now, we're enjoying each other's company here in these sessions. But if you go to a Minecraft server, you also do that. It's like Second Life in a way. Uh, you're wandering around a world and uh, enjoying the interactions there. So, um, so that's what we did for a few weeks until we got to know each other. And then we put the world into uh, a game mode. Game mode is where there suddenly becomes dangerous. There are monsters. But we, we learned another very important thing. And that is that in the game, uh, Jeff was very good at building shelters and inviting people to, to his shelter. So we didn't really have to, because we had a community, we could learn Gradually, we can stay alive, you know, day to day, and learn gradually how to master the game. So uh, it was a very interesting learning experience, and one that I would say derived from uh, this last 15 years of uh, interacting with other teachers and learners in environments like this, where we learn from one another, and we we are willing to take risks and. Um, I'm willing to learn sometimes from people who are younger and um, that we're charged to be teaching. You can learn from them, which is uh, just something that's very interesting. What do you think about that? Do you have any comments?